Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Global M&As, A Path to Thrive in the New Normal. This webinar is presented to you in partnership with Global Upside. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar to ask questions. These questions will be monitored and the presenters will answer as many as possible during or after today's presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on ACG's website along with the slides from today's presentation. Thank you again for joining us. I'd like, you, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. The first is Andrew Wilson, Vice President of Private Equity and M&A. Andrew has extensive experience in mergers, acquisitions, and spinoffs. He spent 10 years with PwC, working primarily in their M&A practice for the consumer goods, heavy engineering, and steel making industries. He worked on the client side as a CFO. At Global Upside, he has led engagements in electronics, manufacturing, and software that involve the big four accounting firms and several international law firms. His areas of expertise include international employment law, human resources, payroll and benefits, finance, and operations support. Next, we have Gary Fielding, Private Equity Operating Advisor. Gary is currently a member of the Operating Advisory Team for Francisco Partners, a global private equity firm which specializes in investments in technology and technology-enabled businesses. He helps portfolio companies increase effectiveness via executive leadership initiatives and operational improvements. He has over 19 years of experience in human capital software and talent, talent strategy. He has led and consulted in a variety of organizations from Fortune 500 corporations to small startups. Gary has extensive experience addressing the people and techno technological aspects of mergers, acquisitions, and divestitures. Finally, we have Brian Kelly, VP co-head of Global Private Equity. Brian is vice president responsible for building the global private equity practice and managing Ceridian's relationships with the industry's top tier global PE firms. For almost 19 years, Brian was involved in investment banking and institutional account management, providing equity, fixed income, and cash management transaction services. Responsibilities also included initial public and secondary offering access, PIPE, LBO, venture capital, and mezzanine capital opportunities through investment and investment banking relationships. Prior to joining Ceridian, Brian successfully structured and launched the Private Equity Alliance Program at Ultimate Software and spent time consulting at ADP. Now I'm going to turn it over to Gary Fielding. Thank you. Appreciate you having us on the call. Uh, I want to first start by talking a little bit about Francisco Partners and who we are. Um, um, as Grethel mentioned, we're actually a private equity firm focused on technology and tech-enabled businesses across many verticals. So we have health, healthcare tech, fintech, communications, a, a, a wide range of technology and tech-enabled businesses. Um, we have a deep experience in with over 115 platform companies and over 190 follow-on acquisitions, and we've done work around divestitures and carve-outs um, as well um, that have all been part of our, our remit here. We were founded in 1999. Um, there are 50 investment professionals and 25 operating partners. I'm on the operating partner side, a part of the organization called Francisco Partners Consulting, and we focus on helping portfolio companies create value or working with them on operational initiatives such as a, a M&A or carve out or helping companies to build up out there after a divestiture from a larger company. Um, offices in New York, San Francisco, and London. I'm actually based in Atlanta, but is uh, and the operating partner team is, is, is based all over the U.S. So, next slide. Um, so, uh, we all have heard and we, we hear about this every day in terms of what's happening with the, the COVID-19 pandemic and we know that it's causing numerous economic and societal impacts around the world. Uh, first of it, first of which is it, the varied um, response to it around the world and how some countries are uh, growing in their numbers, some are declining, some are at level, uh, leveling off, so it's a, a varied experience around the world. Um, also, it's a synchronized downturn in, in global markets. So the IMF, IMF has reported a, a negative 4.9% in GDP growth for 2020. Um, and, and those are our projections because you know, I think those, those numbers change 
uh, pretty frequently because we just, we're in such unprecedented times and, and trying to get their hands around this. Um, but but we know that there is a downturn in global markets that uh, in terms of global GDP growth. There's also limited global mobility, so people are moving around. Um, a lot less, you know, my, and myself based here in the U.S. is a lot more difficult to travel to certain places around the world than it would have been a year ago. Uh, this also shifts in working arrangements um, to largely remote, and, and many of us now are working from home, and, and the work arrangements, arrangements that we have uh, are, are not what they were a year ago, but people are spending a lot more time uh, distance and, and working in, in remote places. Also, we have the consumption and service uh, around the world. So, so people have been, because of voluntary social distancing and income losses and weaker consumer choice uh, confidence, you know, consum consumption and service output is, it has, been, has dropped. Um, we also have a negative impact on the labor market. So if you look at uh, Q1 2020 versus uh, 2019 Q4, it, it, it equated to something like a loss of 130 million full-time jobs globally. And I know that number has either incre increased and decreased over the year. So, um, so definitely there's been a huge global impact from, from what we're experiencing with COVID-19. On, on top of that, we have uh, also happening in our global environment, civil unrest and protests concerning racial injustice and inequality. Uh, around the world, and we also have a looming election in the U.S. and other political people around the world that we have to also contend with that may also have impacts uh, one way or the other uh, as we, we, we uh, sort of navigate the markets. If we think about the, the impact to M&A activity in particular in North America, this is data from PitchBook, um, the growth in M&A activity over the past several years has been a sustaining force for, 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 for uh, private equity in particular, um, and, and a really a value creation engine. Um, if you look at 2019, you had 13,000 deals, over thir almost 13,000 deals worth over $2 trillion um, in, uh, in 2019 alone. If you look at 2020, uh, Q1 and Q2, it has seen a decline year over year uh, 33 of 33.1% and 26.7% respectively. So there's, there's definitely in, in the, in the in activity area for North America, there is uh, a bit of uncertainty that is starting to somewhat level out, but with, you know, a, a particular, a, a potential for a second wave, you know, there may be impacts to that coming as well. And, and also, if you look at it by sector, it, it is not necessarily a, a consistent um, experience. So, so healthcare and tech sectors have seen growth in steady volume, um, given what's happening in the world, but also you've seen deals being done as a matter of survival in, in areas such as oil and gas. But I guess the, 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 the bottom line here is that there is definitely an impact on M&A activity and it's decreased in some areas and increased in others. But um, deals are being done uh, in, in, in different ways. In, in Europe, it's a similar picture, but slightly different. Um, if you look at the, this data actually just came out yesterday um, in terms of M&A activity, but I think if you look at Q1, there was definitely a projection that it would be down, but I think it's probably been a little bit further, uh, been, been more activity than what one would have expected. Um, in terms of deal volume, but similarly in the past, you know, it had, has been a generation engine just as it had been for, the, for North America, but slightly different in terms of how it's bearing out in, in, in Europe. And there have been some pretty large deals over the, the last couple of months that have really increased the, the size of deal value uh, as well. That, that's, that's been a little bit different than what, how it's been in the U.S. Um, but, the, but similarly, there has been some similarities around B2B software businesses and healthcare being sort of leaders here for um, keeping value and then some of the distress areas around energy being um, uh, ha deals happening, but the value has been a little bit uh, de depressed. Next slide. Um, so in terms of thinking about this presentation and, and what we share with you, I, I sort of want to think about what from Francisco Partners perspective, what I've seen uh, in my role in operating as an operating advisor in terms of what creates operational success for M&A. So if we look at um, a couple of these in particular, 
I won't go into all of them, but one of the ones that I, I think has been really important for us is the alignment of the alignment of teams. And this is alignment of deal teams, operating advisory teams, and 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 the approach of the portfolio company and how do you align those things together. So that is around communication, that is around priority, that is around prior uh, um, figuring out what's the right things that happen for for deal one. And then the other one is strategic vendor partnerships. And this has been something before COVID and even now that's really been helpful to us. And that is everything from understanding who uh, in our networks could can can help us from a, whether it's a pre PM perspective or due diligence on, on particular deals and, and getting them aligned and to success around a uh, uh, day one. And that's also everything, including tax and payroll and HRIS and financial systems, but having partnerships with companies who understand the private equity world, who understand M&A, who understand how to work with our teams um, has been pretty critical for us in terms of delivering value. I mean, we, we work in a leveraged fashion, so there's only 25 of us in the operating advisory team. So. Um, with 50 or so portfolio companies, you can imagine that we need those partnerships to help us to better to, to deliver value for those portfolio companies. Next slide. So in terms of what's been different around um, M&A and, and some of the challenges that we've had to navigate, um, I'll start with sort of diligence on target companies. So um, there were a lot of deals and, and some of the data suggests that some of the deals that are now closing or have been closing in the second quarter were mostly deals that were started in 2019 or started before so that you know there's some of that coming to um, come to bear but it's, it's definitely a lot more scrutiny around evaluating the operational health of a target company so you you there's always been evaluation of that in terms of understanding what, what capabilities are there, but there's definitely a higher level of scrutiny and, and understanding whether those companies, how, how they will fare in terms of the uncertainty of the future that is, that is now. There's also a greater focus on analytics and data, data to, to evaluate this. And that's always been a focus in private equity, but there's definitely been a heightened focus on it um, because in the absence of being able to meet with uh, target company leaders or uh, or sellers, um, it, it, you definitely have to rely a lot more on uh, how you, uh, the data that you have and, and, and networks to be able to do source, uh, to be able to do diligence. Um, there's also limited in-person connections. So, so we're all experiencing uh, the, ability, the lack of the ability to go and sit down and, and have a coffee chat or a dinner with a, a management team or to, un, to, to go in and walk uh, the halls of a particular company and understand, look at a little bit of a better sense of the culture of that company. Um, and also, um, you know, sort of being able to build that trust element up between uh, deal makers. Um, that's been a really big thing as part of uh, a part of M&A activity. I was talking to one of our operating partners who talked about you know, a deal that, that we, we, we delayed in terms of selling uh, for over the summer. And then over the summer, that, that, that company ended up making two acquisitions um, in, in two different countries um, in, the, in Europe. And then they, that company was based in, in, in the U.S. So it was just interesting that it, it, he mentioned to me, he said, you know, those two companies, that, those acquisitions happen, I think, because those two companies already knew the people that were involved, so they already had a relationship established, so they made the, the process a lot um, easier for that to happen. And I think, you know, people are definitely relying on um, some of those relationships um, as they've navigated the beginning of this. But I, I think there's definitely increased uses of video to help facilitate that. There's definitely um, more, uh, an increase in the number of virtual interactions that need to happen to sort of deal with some of the, the lack of in, uh, in, in in-person communications. The other one is around sort of a divided focus of portfolio company leaders. And, and you know, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of attention that needed to be paid by portfolio company leaders on uh, ensuring that their business was in a place that could uh, A, manage the current issues, but also be able to be in a place that they could navigate the uncertain future. So, um, Definitely, we had to uh, make sure we, as a portfolio company, put together 
a, a way of assessing and helping our companies assess that in, in, in a very structured and organized way. But we also were, were able to consolidate resources. So instead of companies going out to try and get all their own resources on their own, whether that be PPE, whether that's access to information, whether that's um, anything that they need to, to sustain themselves through COVID, we pull together a, a centralized set of resources for companies, including delivering you know, uh, CHRO forums or CEO forums or CFO forums that we could get information out to people as things were happening. And we had, uh, we've, we've had that be from weekly to biweekly to now monthly, now that we've gone through some of the some of the, the cycles here, but that was really invaluable for helping our companies have a, a good focus so that they could not only have to focus on just running their business and dealing with COVID, but if, if there is any activity happen, they could have some brain share to sort of focus on that as well. And then also we provided operational and third party support. Again, I, I reference back to strategic partnerships. So we were able to come alongside and we, we, we do that even today to come alongside them with um, additional resources to help uh, in executing a successful M&A work. Next slide. Um, some of the other areas is uh, limited talent evaluation methods. So uh, again, without the ability to be in person, you have to be a little bit more creative about how you evaluate, evaluate talent when you are building companies, whether it's from a divestor and you're building up a new company and trying to bring talent in or you're making changes because of M&A activity. Um, so we definitely have assessment tools and enhanced processes that we've done around talent evaluation. And we also have um, deeper reference checking, uh, as well as a more thorough sort of video screening, screening pro interview and screening processes. Um, in terms of the limited M&A support, so with COVID and with some of the uh, issues happening around the world, uh, companies have had to reduce staff. Uh, so, they, so they definitely have less staff to do uh, something that was already more complicated around M&A. So, you know, some of the things we've had to do is obviously prioritize some of the work around M&A in terms of what's important for phase one. So really taking a good look at what's important for day one activities and maybe what's not so important and really making sure that aligns the deal thesis and, and also uh, being able to supplement services. So we've had companies come in. We, I, I was just working on a, a carve out that had a day one on July 1st with the company. And throughout that process, at the beginning of the process, we identified that the team needed to have a consulting support for, for the payroll and implement and HRIS back office implementation. So um, the third party organization helped the company from the start to finish and they, they help with validation, they help with parallel testing, they help all those things to really, really provide an extra set of arms and legs for the team. And that just made it us to be able to meet our timelines um, and be able to do this quickly, as opposed to assuming that there was the company, the, the, the team had to, everything they could do to, to manage this on their own. Um, but we partnered with them and they were really appreciative of it. And they were able to get off to a really quick and successful start because of it. Um, and also the rapidly changing reg regulations and laws. So there's, uh, you know, again, we talked about the centralized sources of information that we provided for the portfolio, but, you know, managing the onslaught of changing laws and information and the differences in locales and regions and how, how they are all addressing these things differently was really important for uh, companies and make sure they stay compliant. And this is, you know, both um, in the U.S. and all around the world, there are so many different things changing. So we had experts come from law firms and um, consulting firms come and talk to our companies about specifically what's changing. And we keep an updated um, access to that information that they can see on a weekly basis. It's a listing of the laws and regulations that have changed and needs to be mindful of. And we send out reminders on particular things that we think are really important so that our leaders are aware of them. And lastly, um, you know, just the difficulty in building new culture and brand identity as a part of doing M&A work, you know, a large part of it is the people aspects and how do you bring people together or how do you uh, bring a leadership team together that may be from different companies um, or how do you address uh, when a company is, is standing up on its own, is coming out of a larger, larger company and it's a smaller company and it's a whole different culture. Um, 
but we really advised him on creating task force to create a way, creative, to find creative ways to address problems dealing with it in a pandemic. We have one of our companies that is doing, for example, they are doing a new brand launch for the company that they've come out of, come out of, they're doing it, had a new name and they're doing a brand launch and it's going to be a drive through brand launch. They had a critical mass in a particular location. So they are doing a drive through brand launch where people are coming to get their swag. They're coming to get their new badges. They're coming to get, uh, you know, a box lunch to carry out, but it's just a way to sort of deal with what's happening in a creative way, but also to try and uh, in, infuse some of that culture into the organization that needs to be to build a new or to build a new company. Um, and also just flexibility. So we, we, we've asked companies to really think about, especially with the remote working and how all that's changing, think long-term where you want to be as an organization, what works for your business, what works for the, in terms of what was happening with the deal thesis. And then you need to build from here to there a flexible plan because there's so much uncertainty. All you know that there's going to be things that are changing, but you can at least say and put a target on where you think you want to be as an organization and how you want to operate. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Andrew. Thank you, Gary, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming along today. Um, I'm with Global Upside. We also were founded in 1999. Uh, so we have offices on every continent around the world. We have over 600 uh, professionals. Um, on our team, and we specialize uh, from an M&A and carve-out standpoint, mostly on the buy side in terms of uh, due diligence as it relates to uh, the employment status, uh, personnel files, um, employment agreements, as well as uh, the employee transition and communications, uh, human resources, payroll, and benefits stand-up, and the putting in place the legal and tax structures. Uh, we also support uh, companies, uh, portfolio companies, uh, with their uh, ongoing human resources, payroll, benefits administration, counting, tax and compliance support, and then preparing for an exit. So um, we are a preferred partner with um, Francisco Partners, and uh, we have worked on uh, um, carve-outs with them, uh, the largest of which was uh, in 35 countries with 3,600 employees internationally. Next slide, please. So in terms of the new normal and uh, obviously what uh, we've seen, and this is very much focused uh, from um, you know, the, the actions that governments have been taking in the various countries to deal with the crisis and what they have been putting in place in terms of, of, uh, of really uh, attempting to support employees in each of the countries. Um, obviously, Europe, Central America, South America already had very uh, extensive and strong safety nets and uh, certainly addressed a lot of the issues around statutory leave, sick pay and pay time off and had extensive unemployment to pay and benefits. Uh, it really has been a story about what has been going on uh, around the world in terms of their ability to respond to the crisis from a resources standpoint and the approach that they have been taken. Uh, the Central and South American countries really um, do not have the resources to um, put a lot of financing in place to support their infrastructure. So uh, they've taken very much the defensive standpoint of enhancing the labor laws, enhancing the employee protections, uh, and extending um, their the sick pay and pay time off and employment benefits. Uh, so it really made it more onerous for companies doing business down in South, Central and South America um, and more complicated from a longer term perspective in terms of, of dealing with um, acquisitions down there and also restructuring and aligning your business. Europe obviously has uh, taken a different approach. Um, after the 2008 crisis, uh, they, certain countries, uh, particularly Germany, had put in uh, extensive support schemes to try and encourage companies to maintain employment and to uh, deal with situations where they could provide financing so that they could achieve short-term time work and temporary layoffs uh, to see companies through the crises uh, and then hopefully move back to to uh, you know, normal operations quickly. So 
Um, Germany is uh, obviously the most advanced, but so uh, you've seen France, uh, you've seen Italy, you've seen the UK. Uh, all of the major economies have put in some type of short-term work or temporary support uh, to pay the salaries and benefits of workers in, in the short term until uh, they can see normal operations uh, uh, occurring. A lot of this has been extended through through the end of the year. Uh, and uh, really, they're looking at providing anything from 60 to 90 percent of the of the salaries and benefit supports to these workers. Asia uh, hasn't really seen uh, as drastic uh, a an effect of COVID and hasn't had really a lot to do there in terms of the, the support processes because uh, whilst it was certainly the the, the initial point of uh, of starting points of COVID, um, it really was clamped down and uh, and they really did return to normal much quicker than the rest of the world. Uh, the other aspect has been very much the border closures, the immigration, the long-term changes. And, um, you know, this obviously happened in the US, but internationally it has happened as well, where uh, governments have, have taken uh, the position not only to Im impose border closures and restrict immigration in the short term, uh, but now they are uh, looking at um, put it, they put in place long term changes to make it harder for uh, people to uh, gain work permits, visas and employment passes and working in those countries. So really will affect things for the long term in terms of, of uh, looking at mergers and acquisitions uh, and how uh, you deal with uh, you know, foreign nationals working in different countries. Next slide. So in terms of, uh, again, keying off what Gary had said on mergers and acquisitions and carve-outs, uh, really from a due diligence perspective, there's a greater emphasis in terms of, um, especially from an employment law perspective and understanding what the employment status of all the employees is um, internationally. Uh, as we've seen the changes and the regulatory compliance come through, and also, uh, it, we see the fact that uh, obviously most countries around the world have a lot more onerous uh, labor law restrictions than the U.S. does. Uh, so it really requires a lot of better understanding in terms of the uh, employment arrangements of the employees with the companies and, uh, and how to go about the tra transition process. Uh, but also it's created great uncertainty with the employees themselves and the work environments. and. Uh, and just this uh, whole situation of, a, of you know, that continuing employment, uh, which will need to be addressed more up front in terms of what's going on. Um, Global Upside is a company where we can support uh, uh, carve-outs and mergers and acquisitions with um, our own PEO employer record services. So we have our, our, our own legal entities in over 50 countries around the world, and we have the support organizations to do uh, the transition directly to the uh, to the PEO um, employment of record services, uh, but we also do specialize in rapid setup of legal entities and putting the tax structures in place um, in terms of being able to transition directly. I think this is going to be more important in the future as you try to maintain uh, the, the terms and conditions of employment and transition employees under their existing employment contracts because that is really going to be a method where you can look towards, um, you know, uh, if you can transition them directly, then uh, you're not going to trigger anything in terms of any involuntary terminations and a potential liability as you move forward. Um, we obviously support for preparing for day one in terms of the, uh, the setup, uh, keying off the due diligence and understanding what the employee transition is going to require. Um, how to go about it in the various countries, standing up the uh, HR, the payroll systems, the benefits uh, system, the um, you know the Oracle, SAP, uh, Ceridian, Workday um, systems, so that you can cope effectively with it. Uh, and we do specialize in these type of best class of systems, so that we can make sure that everything is prepared well in advance, so that. Uh, Come whatever day one is about to happen, uh, you're in a position to be basically onboard them and move forward with um, seamless continuation of operations. 
So from a, 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 a human resources standpoint, in terms of uh, really understanding a lot more about the due diligence and the impacts of these changes that are being made in a lot of the countries uh, and how to go around the uh, employment, uh, obviously a lot more emphasis, not just on the employment agreements and the personnel files, but also the company policies and terms and conditions that have affected them. Uh, because really now you're looking more in terms of the fact of, of understanding, uh, you know, wh what is going to be the impact of the of things like the acquired rights directive, to pay collective bargaining agreements, unions, uh, and works councils, because um, the, you know, the concept of vested rights and constructive discharge is going to play a lot more in terms of, of making sure that uh, as you transition the employees and trying to make sure that you maintain the comparable equivalent to work conditions and you deal with the required communications, um, it's going to be a lot more into play in terms of making sure that you, that you make that happen successfully uh, and you planned and you really have a, you know everything in order before you get to uh, the day one process uh, to make sure that you can deal with everything as you do go through the requirements in each of the countries um, to make sure that is successful. Uh, the immigration, uh, which is uh, typically the, 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 the large problem when it comes to transitioning employees, uh, uh, the time uh, lags that occur in terms of being able to deal with uh, the transition of the work permits and visas or getting new work permits and visas um, will have to be planned a lot earlier in terms of the requirements and just making sure that um, you know, that, you know, everyone's fully aware uh, the processes have been started. If you are putting in the new legal and tax structures that you're applying for any uh, um, immigration sponsorship licenses and everything that you need to start the work permit process and put the visas in place. So a lot more for planning from a, an immigration standpoint. So really, uh, we do specialize a lot in terms of trying to set up, um, you know, legal entities, branches, uh, or non-resident employer registrations quickly and efficiently. Um, so it, really, it's a uh, complete solution from our perspective in terms of being able to do the incorporation registrations, uh, provide whatever you need from a registered, registered office resident director perspective, get the registrations for you know, the income taxes, the VAT, GST, HST, uh, payroll taxes, statutory benefits, everything you need to get operational quickly. Um, and, and because we do it more of as an integrated solution, we typically take 30 to 45 days to set it in most countries. Obviously, if you're talking about uh, countries like Brazil, China, France, Japan, Philippines, it's a whole different world, but uh, we have a lot of experience in terms of Getting that, so, uh, getting that up and running quickly. I think this is going to be very important as, uh, as uh, we move forward because, as I said, I think transition of employees uh, to direct employment uh, is going to be a lot more preferable and easy to communicate as we move forward as opposed to the PEO in some senses because uh, it is one of those situations where uh, they're going to be a lot more comfortable, you're going to provide that certainty, and it's going to be very beneficial as they move forward. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, we have our own legal entities in about 50 plus countries. Uh, we do support uh, PEO employer record in over 150 countries around the world. Very uh, great uh, vehicle in terms of, of um, you know, small populations, countries that are not strategic to you in terms of being able to hire quickly and provide that immediate employment. Um, it is, as I said, that you going forward, the potential issues you have with to pay ARDs and CBAs and unions is going to be more prevalent. So they're going to require more planning in terms of the human resources, payroll and benefits support as we move forward. Uh, and as always, um, addressing the supplemental benefits issues of being able to provide those comparable or equivalent benefits is going to be a major player in this uh, certain aspect of it. Next slide, please. So from an existing portfolio company, uh, private equity firm, uh, the things that we are seeing as we move forward um, and companies, are, uh, you know, uh, as Gary said, uh, you know, you, they need to focus and, and really uh, continue operations as we uh, go through this pandemic. 
Um, we are seeing a lot in terms of uh, continuing emphasis on, on growth. Uh, I think uh, companies saw the downturn uh, in the, um, you know, at the end of the first quarter and the second quarter. We've seen companies uh, starting to expand uh, fairly aggressively uh, in APAC and in Europe and really look to expand their uh, existing networks in those regions or um, enter those regions as they stabilize quickly and those economies have started to come back more quickly. So, uh, so that really is um, you know, something where uh, you know, while we deal with sort of the, uh, you know, the certainly we're not over this pandemic um, it, by any way, shape, or form. Uh, companies are saying that um, growth can happen again, and, and we should be taking advantage of it in terms of of seeing these markets stabilized. Uh, the other area with where Gary alluded to in terms of talent acquisition and being able to diversify your operations, it has created. Um, opportunities, and as companies have considered now going more global, um, I think uh, you know clients are looking at uh, where can we provide get their, the best talent, where we can we do it, diversify, what can we do in terms of being more proactive in terms of making that happen. And again, the whole work from home and global mobility, um, and really it leads you to assess. Uh, you know whether you need uh, those office uh, spaces, whether you can go more virtual, how are you going to move forward in terms of those operational needs? Um, and, and from that aspect, in terms of mo moving more people to work virtually, and then assessing, uh, you know, your cost structures and, uh, you know, are you paying a premium for PEO hires in certain countries? Uh, you know, should you be looking to rationalize and, and look for more cost effectiveness in terms of how you're employing people in the various global markets? Um, address those issues as well as you know issues where you might be created permanent establishment and tax nexus issues because there is going to be a lot more government scrutiny moving forward. Next slide, please. And then in terms of existing systems, um, obviously day one comes uh, and often you end up with integrated or patchwork systems so from a human resources, payroll, time and attendance, accounting standpoint. Uh, this is a great time to reevaluate that, not only from the perspective of um, the, you know, the partners who are providing you that outsourced operational support, uh, but also to upgrade and automate your systems, come up with better processes, um, consolidate the systems in terms of what you need to do in terms of the various functional areas, uh, really sort of uh, get in the position to for your companies to be streamlined, realigned, and, and better equipped to move forward as we go through this pandemic. And with that, I'll hand it over to Brian. Hey, thank you, Andrew, and, and thank you, Gary, and I appreciate everybody joining us this afternoon. Uh, once again, my name is Brian Kelly, and I'm the Vice President and Co-Head of our Global Private Equity Practice at Ceridian. Uh, my partner, Susan Johnson, who's also a co-head of the program, spent uh, uh, almost 28 years in the industry, uh, 20 at ADP, and it helped build the program at Ultimate Software and Ceridian with me here. Uh, so very excited to talk to you a little bit about uh, our space here and how it relates to what's going on in the new norm. Uh, for those of you out there who are not familiar with Ceridian or may have seen us, uh, we've been around for about 88 years, spawned out of IBM a long time ago. And in 2007, we're taken private by TH Lee and, and at that point proceeded to go through a transformation. Uh, TH Lee sold off pretty much all of our non-core assets in the HCM space and partnered us with a time and, and management solution company and proceeded to build our new solution called Dayforce. Uh, Dayforce is a single record solution, has a single line of code, and is truly a one single global system of record solution in the marketplace today, uh, covering about 157 countries. And the dual part of our practice that Susan and I run at Ceridian, we have our carve out and M&A practice, then we do our standard HRIS practice with uh, private equity firms. We have about 320 private equity firms in our practice right now. Uh, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you some of the challenges that we're seeing in the industry and, and some of the solutions to those challenges that we're working on. Uh, next slide, please. In taking a look at uh, some of the global system challenges that are out in the marketplace today, I identified seven challenges that we are seeing, not, not only before the pandemic, but are now more prevalent and, and really proving troublesome with the new norm. 
The first one I'm gonna talk about is fragmented solution landscape. Fragmented solutions, as you all know, can snowball into a number of different issues, whether it be com compliance risk, uh, data inconsistencies, employee or, or administrator frustrations. And this is going to really lead to the inability to provide impactful feedback. And, and right now, when we're seeing systems out there where, where a provider is more of a system aggregator, they're not going to have the influence on the source product roadmap within that organization. And that, therefore, is going to lead them to inadequate system visibility. When you have that type of landscape, you're looking at then splintered data, which is a major problem using numerous systems. It's going to increase the IT burden, and it's going to limit access to actionable data support and decision making, especially when times like this come up. Um, so when we see situations like this, the inability to predict what areas of the organizations are going to be impacted are really heightened and actually really focused on during times like this that we're seeing in the COVID pandemic. If we drop down to the second bullet, outdated IT infrastructure, if you think about it, in-house IT simply is just not going to cut it right now when we're trying to thrive in the new normal. We talked about it in the previous bullet, increased IT burden. IT departments right now are thin, and, and when you have a situation where an in-house solution is, is really installed, it's gonna be very difficult when it's outdated in a situation like this. A lot of organizations, and you may be experiencing this right now, found out the hard way that on-prem solutions really have significant shortfalls. Those shortfalls were really focused on when our populations of employees are now moving to the remote workforce. A lot of organizations are playing catch up right now, but those that have been staying on the cutting edge of IT and, and the cloud-based solutions that are out there really have been able to stay in front of the challenges or at least help maintain the scenarios that they're in right now. The next bullet we identified was rigid technology. You really can no longer remain competitive with, with stagnant and, and outdated mindset. I mean, the market is changing every single day. Cloud technology and technology, especially in the HRIS space, is changing rapidly. And you really have to address those changes to stay in front of situations that we're seeing right now. Technologies that have rigid configuration, those capabilities tend to be like that, that old saying, like the, the jack of all trades, but, but really a master of none. And, and that contrast can also provide very, very significant problems when an IT department has to address pandemics like we're seeing right now. A solution that's, that's customized to fit your business needs is always going to result in managing extra upkeep and maintenance and in-house and fees in any changes that are required in that particular system. So the flexibility really is not there to move on the fly when you have to do that in, in situations that we're in right now. And not being able to pivot for that remote workforce has really become a great deal of, of, of strain and pressure on a lot of organizations today. And, and finally, when you look at those you know, you know, rigid environments, you're unable to really reskill and inform your employees around changes. And today we've had changes come across our desk every single day. And again, you're not having the ability to move and to pivot off of those particular scenarios. Next bullet we had is variable cost impact. Not surprisingly, as you all can probably imagine, organizations labor spend has significant impact on profitability across every industry out there. And without the ability to, to really accurately forecast and predict labor costs, organizations today in this environment are really unable to retain or control one of their biggest spends, which is their, their, their workforce. And it's driving down profitability and it's causing layoffs and it's causing a lot of disruptions in organizations. And they're not prepared to deal with what COVID has pre presented us in this environment today. And we look at the pace of regulatory and compliance changes. Again, this was discussed earlier, but it's very pertinent when we talk about the HCM world, which is human capital management. When we have the presence of labor deployment and payroll execution, it can require a great deal of significant time allocated to individual resources to stay up to date on all of those changes that apply to businesses. And without a provider or a partner that can provide that, again, extreme amount of stress and challenges to an organization that's already thin in itself. We take a look at the inability to scale as we move down towards the end of this, this slide. 
Many organizations, as you know, have had to scale down significantly during this pandemic. Not all solutions can manage this while supporting business continuity. And many employees, as, as we have seen, and I know we have seen in, in our business, they've had to take on duties where they're really not normal to their day-to-day -day activities. And it's been very challenging for them to try to adapt to a system that, that's not easily adaptable. Without intuitive solutions, the time to productivity in assuming additional tasks for these employees not only could cripple, but has crippled a number of organizations, really forcing them to retain additional payroll costs and further impacting profit margins in a time right now where every penny counts. And finally, all this leads to really disengaged employees. Disengaged workforce right now is, you know, employees can easily feel disconnected when they have to move out remotely. You've got financial hardships, isolation, reduced communication, and many more outcomes that have been really developed from this, this COVID new world that we're in right now. This is gonna result in a loss of productivity, as you can imagine. You got overall drop in job satisfaction and, and, and frankly, mental health. And all this can also reduce collaboration between an organization. So that disjointed side of it really starts to show itself. Financial stress though has the strongest impact on employer productivity. 55% of US employees have had trouble covering expenses between pay periods over the last six months. So you can only imagine what that's doing to workforces that are still being required to wear many different hats in their environments today. So with these challenges, I wanna to jump to the next slide that talks about some of the solutions that we're seeing in our business and how we're able to address those. And the first bullet here is consolidated technologies. Consolidated technologies simply means a single solution that can handle not just the most complex company requirements, but the most important and impactful uh, can actually help accuracy and optimize the process. And I'm not sitting here saying that everything must live in a single location. We know that's not feasible, but select, I'm sorry, select technology is what I'm trying to say there. It really has mastered an area of business tech. And when you have a situation like an HCM solution or an ERP solution, you want to make sure they have the interoperability and the capabilities to connect with the master areas of other specific specialties within that organization. We also want to see embracing technological change. The evolution of technology, as I mentioned in some of the challenges in the previous slide, and the migration to the cloud was not something to fear, but to embrace. And I think all of us on this, on this call are seeing that in our day-to-day -day operations. Those that realize that were able to continue those operations and really be flexible and capitalize on this next move. And we see flexibility and agility dovetailing with, that, with what I just said, flexible solutions have helped numerous organizations navigate that early uncertainty and the continued uncertainty of possibly a second wave that's in front of us. That flexibility and agility in labor deployment not only can help control labor costs, but it actually can help keep employees informed about that changing work environment. And as I mentioned cost, being able to control variable costs is really important, not only in a SaaS environment, but a single solution environment. Labor costs have a huge implication on organizations' bottom line. And in times like this, we really need to be able to ensure that you've got complete visibility and control around any variable costs and labor spend. Moving on to almost the last point here, we got partnership excellence. Lean on those technology providers, like the Francisco partners, like the Global Upside partners that are able to consult with your organizations. Treat them as an extension of the organization. And yeah, I mean, when you're, when you're hiring these partners and you're bringing them on, what better way to bring best, best practices to your clientele and help them understand how the industry is changing and how we're overcoming challenges that the pandemic has dropped on us. Um, taking a look at one solution fits all or, or enabling a bi-directional scalability side of things, find a solution that can both grow and contract within the organization. We see that by ensuring that you have a solution that supports that need, it's going to help support the growth model, it's going to empower the employees, and it's going to enable those employees to be able to delegate duties and responsibilities in an, an intuitive way and not by association and by default that they have to do that. And finally, wrapping up, prioritizing that employment engagement. With employment engagement, 64% of HR leaders right now are prioritizing the employee experience more than before the pandemic. 
engaged employees can lead to 21% greater profitability and 59% less turnover. So attracting and developing and retaining that top talent is really key to recovering from the pandemic here. Financial stability, though, through those innovative technologies, we have seen not only through our particular client base, but it's helped many employees navigate through these tough times, whether it's through solutions like on-demand pay, which is a solution that we brought out where employees have the ability to access their pay every single day. So having more flexibility, being on the cutting edge of technology can really help shape the employee engagement and help people get through these very tough times right now. So with that said, I'm going to turn it back to Gretel, and I think we're going to open it to questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, so we did have a couple of questions come in. Um, the first one that I see here is from David, and he's asking, how are you handling the inability to travel to conduct technical due diligence, facility evaluations, and management interviews? Yeah, this is Gary. I can talk a little bit about um, sort of the technical part of it. You know, most of our companies are more software related companies. So our technical due diligence has often been virtual even before the pandemic. Um, I think the difference would be that if you're walking through and, and we have partners that come in and help us with diligence as well on the technical side and product side. You know, typically there would be meetings, you know, a series of meetings in person, but now those series of meetings are happening via virtual meeting meeting. So it's that's changing and, and that is definitely challenging to do, but it, it, it is possible. Um, and I turn in terms of like management meetings and things of that nature. Um, again, and actually some companies and it's we started to see a few companies actually still want to meet. Like they want to come and see in person and, and, and I think there are limited scenarios where that happens. Um, but again, those are still happening virtually. Um, sort of, so you're getting comfortable with managers and, 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 and sellers and, and you're making sort of pulling sellers and purchase together, purchasers together via, via virtual meetings. And, and that's the way some of them are happening. Great, thank you for that answer, Gary. Um, so I have another question here um, and it's asking, uh, if you are working with an organization where it makes sense for them to pull out of the PEO model, how do you go about the process to educate them on the pros and cons? How do you help them identify specific areas where they will see cost savings? I can take that one, Gretel. Uh, I think from the PEO perspective, um, it, uh, oftentimes what you do find is that, um, especially when you have a number of employees in a country, that um, they, it, it's very cost effective from the perspective that you have much lower payroll costs, benefit costs, even though you do have to commit to um, some tax and compliance uh, type of costs in terms of of um, the support um, and, and obviously there are various ways uh, that there's a legal entity which obviously doesn't in, uh, involve having the um, annual compliance income tax return filings and things of that nature there are also possibilities in some countries where you can actually register a foreign entity just for payroll taxes and the statutory benefits and and uh, not have to actually incorporate a legal entity but i think the ongoing costs um, especially when you have multiple employees and you're paying a PEO on, the, on a per employee basis can lead, lead to a lot more cost effective uh, solution. Um, there obviously in terms of the transition, um, you know, you, you do have to go through uh, often the PEO will want to terminate and rehire. Uh, Global Upside is one of the few where we will transition the employees directly to the newly formed legal entity or, you know, to direct employment, but there Often we can go through an analysis and demonstrate based on the, um, you know, the fees that they're paying, uh, you know, what they will see in cost savings longer term, although obviously there will be some initial setup costs. Great, thank you for that. Uh, and I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, I have this question here that asks, are there any aspects of operations or systems where you think companies have been lacking in their response? What effect has that had? Well, 
Well, I mean, I, I think, and this is Gary, I, I think, you know, one of the things that Ryan said earlier um, around sort of the, the systems that are not integrated together well, or they have sort of a, a lot of complexity um, around them and, and being able to sort of navigate that complexity and bring and bring, especially if you're doing M&A work where you sort of try to bring complexity on top of the complexity. Um, I think companies are, even before the pandemic, they were challenged in doing that. But I think even now that you have limited the ability to be able to get in a room and sort of hash things out on ideas on how or, or road mapping or design, designing what the new system should look like, I think, you know, companies are just challenged in that area. I think, I think that, again, I think there's a way to do it in a way that makes things go a lot better. Um, but I think companies have to pay a lot more attention to what they're doing when they're, when they're sort of merging systems and merging processes all together. And I think that's where I think I see some of the challenges for companies. And I think picking up on that, Gretel, I, I think that uh, what we see is not a, is, is often you'll inherit, uh, you know, using uh, different systems, uh, be it for accounting, payroll, human resources, benefits in each of the countries, um, a different partner supporting them, and it does not uh, effective communication, or you're running different processes. And, and, and so there's a move towards sort of need, wanting to centralize. Uh, but then even from a, um, an enterprise standpoint, the, you know, the fact that you're often maintaining um, you know, databases in your HCM system, in your, uh, you know, your, uh, your ERP system, your payroll system, your benefit system, and, and maintaining those when they don't com communicate effectively with each other leads to uh, a lot of dysfunction and a lot of, uh, of, of need to the manpower to kind of keep up to date. But or obviously the oracle uh, errors and, uh, and mistakes happen because uh, you are trying to maintain so many databases. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. We have about two minutes hey, Brett, left. No, I just want to just, oh, sure. just, just add one thing to that. I think the thing, and as I was talking to other operating partners, I think the thing that stood out to me that they said is that people often underestimate the people aspect mm -hmm. of changes, even though whether they're finance or, or technical or whatever, but being able to clearly communicate the goals, um, sort of the end state goals that you're trying to reach to and staying in constant communication and moving things forward with the project, I think have been some, some challenges for, for companies in this era uh, in particular and understanding that is a really important aspect of for how you can have m &A success. Great, thank you so much for that, Gary. Um, and I think actually that's a great um, way to leave it. Um, all other questions will be addressed by the panelists after the presentation if they weren't answered during. Uh, thank you all again so much for joining us for this webinar, Global m and A Path to Thrive in the New Normal, presented in partnership with Global Upside. Thanks everyone. <laughs>